In this talk, we're going to talk about biomarkers of cancer. And this will be an overview talk. Cancer biomarkers. We used to call them tumour markers. They're substances, usually proteins, that are produced by the body in response to cancer growth or by the cancer itself. So the first biomarker was discovered in 1847 by Henry Bence Jones. It was present in the urine of a patient with my multiple myeloma and was revealed by simple heat denaturation of the urine. This became known as Bence Jones protein and is actually an immunoglobulin light chain produced by neoplastic plasma cells, which is suggestive of multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So what is a tumour? It's an unregulated growth of abnormal cells which reproduce and spread throughout the body due to mutation within genes responsible for growth and survival. A tumour can be benign, malignant or pre-malignant and neoplasm is the same word as a tumour and cancer is a malignant tumour. And there are over 200 types of cancers. So what are these categories? We have carcinomas, that's the cancers that begin in the skin or in the tissues that line or cover the in internal organs. Sarcomas, cancers that begin in bone, cartilage, fat, muscle, blood vessels or other connective or supportive tissues. Leukemias, cancers that start in blood forming tissues such as the bone marrow and cause an abnormal number of abnormal blood cells to be produced and enter the blood. Lymphomas and myelomas are cancers of the cells of the immune system and central nervous system cancers begin in the tissues of the brain and the spinal cord. So what is the cancer incidence in Vietnam? In Vietnam, cancer is an emerging problem. If we look at the age standardised rate, and this is over the period from 1993 through to 2007, we can see in males in blue, and females in red, there is a rising incidence of cancer. What are the most common cancers in Vietnam? In males, we have lung. This is due to the high prevalence of smoking. Study surveys seem to say between 56 and 72% of the population smoke. Stomach, because of the high prevalence of the Helicobacter pylori infection. Liver, due to the high prevalence of hepatitis B. And then we have bowel, pharynx, esophagus, prostate. In females, it's breast, cervical, lung, stomach and ovarian. Let's now turn to biomarkers. What are they used for? Screening, the primary diagnosis, tumour localisation, staging, prognosis and checks of therapy and monitoring the disease. So what, under what circumstances are they produced? Can be by excess production by the tumour, ectopic production by the tumour or oncofecal biomarkers. Excess production is where biomarkers can be produced by normal tissue from which the tumour is derived. In the case of the tumour, they are produced in great excess. For example, catecholamine secretion by tumours of the adrenal medulla and or PSA production by the prostate. Ectopic production is where the biomarker is not normally produced in the tissue. 
In the tumour, a gene that is normally silent is switched on. For example, ACTH production by certain lung tumours. ACTH is usually produced by the pituitary and not the lung. Oncofetal antigens, for example, alpha feta protein, AFP, or carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA, are known as oncofecal protein, proteins or antigens. They're substances that are usually found in high concentrations in the fetus and usually at low concentrations after birth, but they're re-expressed in certain cancers. So in the embryonic cell, we've got the cell producing cell-specific proteins and oncofecal proteins, but as the cell differentiates, we get to a normal cell where they're not producing the oncofecal proteins, but then in a tumour situation, there's tumour cells being produced, and again, we have the oncofecal proteins being produced. So what would the ideal biomarker be? The ideal biomarker would be both specific and sensitive for a specific cancer type, not present in other conditions. The concentration of the biomarker would relate to the tumour volume. The condition should be treatable. The assay should be cheap and quick. But no such tests are currently available. So if we look at this graphically, we've got concentration of the marker on the x-axis. This is our healthy people. This is our people with the tumour marker. So there's clear differentiation between the two groups and we can put the cutoff in the middle. Two of the things that we talk about with tumour markers is specificity and sensitivity. So specificity is the ability to identify negative results. That's the true negative rate. It's the proportion of people who are known to not have the disease who will test negative for it. So this is specificity where all the people who are healthy are, de are detected. Sensitivity is the ability to detect disease. It's the true positive rate. It's the proportion of people who have the disease and who have the biomarker present. So if we have our cutoff here, we identify all of the people who have the disease. But one of the problems with biomarkers is that there is low sensitivity that's failure to detect those with the disease, that's too many false negatives, and there's low specificity. There's too many other tissue types, pathologies or cancers associated with individual markers. That's too many false positives. So the reality of biomarkers is that we get this crossover and our cutoff will contain some people who have, have the disease but we won't detect some and then we've got people who can have benign diseases or as well which you may be picked up. The FDA, the American FDA has approved nine biomarkers and this listing includes them. So we've got CEA and HER2, um, tumor marker, thyroglobulin, alpha feta protein, PSA, CA125, CA199, CA153, some panel of tests, and the ones we know well of troponin and BNP. These tables list the specificity and sensitivity of these biomarkers. We can see that, or you may not be able to see, that troponin and BNP have very high sensitivity and specificity. However, if we look at PSA, it has a very low sensitivity, but a high specificity. So it's specific for the prostate, but it's not sensitive 
in picking up those people who, uh, it's not sensitive in being able to differentiate between those people who are, have the disease and don't have the disease. The National Academy of Sciences has put out some guidelines and recommendations on tumour markers, a number of documents. This particular one talks on the quality requirements. But the, the biomarkers that they support are the, for testicular cancer, HCG, AFP and LDH. For prostate cancer, PSA and the percentage of free PSA. For colorectal cancer, CEA and for breast cancer, estrogen and progesterone receptors, HER2, and then some more that she includes the ones we know, CA153 and CEA, and then for ovarian cancer, CA125. But there are a lot of new biomarkers being identified with the new principles of studies in genomics and proteomics. So these are candidate biomarkers with diagnostic potential. And over 1,261 proteins has been identified as differentially expressed in cancer. But most of them lack the specificity and sensitivity as individual markers and also have poor diagnostic value. However, panels of markers may be able to supply the specificity and sensitivity that the individual markers cannot. For example, leptin, prolactin, osteopontin and IGF-2 in the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. And so some of the papers that you might see recently have talked about how do we look at these panels and see that they will have the sensitivity and specificity for use in the clinical laboratory and then how do we get them into the clinical laboratory so that they can be used for diagnosis or monitoring in a good turnaround time. What I want to do now is look at two specific cancers and look at our biomarkers for that. The first one will be prostate cancer. So this is the most common tumour in men and nine million men are diagnosed annually. Many men never have symptoms, they undergo no therapy and they eventually die of unrelated diseases. And it's estimated that 42% of men who are greater than 60 years have cancerous foci. However, there is a very poor diagnosis in advanced disease. This is a little hard to see, but this is the increase in prostate cancer in men as the age increases. So what's the worldwide incidence of prostate cancer? cancer. The highest incidences we can see on this map are in North America, in Europe, Scandinavia and in Australia and New Zealand. But this is due really more to the, these countries have a high level of testing for PSA or have population screening. There's population screening currently going on in Scandinavia and it will be introduced into the United Kingdom in the next couple of years. So what biomarkers do we have of, of prostate cancer and what do we want them to do? So the ideal biomarker will be useful for screening of asymptomatic men, so to identify either prostate cancer or pre-malignancy, to diagnose and find the cases so in symptomatic men, we want to distinguish between cancer of the prostate and hypertrophy of the tissues. And then in monitoring, we want to monitor patients who have prostate cancer. But the ideal prostate biomarker is not available at the moment. The biomarkers that we are using, uh, digital rectal examination is obviously a, a part, the very first one. Total prostate specific antigen or PSA, the percentage of free PSA, PSA density as well. Also under evaluation are new ones such as the Prostate Health Index, P PHI, pr 
pro-prostate specific antigen and PCA3 prostate cancer gene 3. Let's talk about PSA. It's a 34 kilodalt serin protease. It is prostate specific, but it is not cancer specific. Can also be elevated in benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, which is where you have large discrete non-cancerous nodules in the periurethral region of the prostate. Also elevated in a urinary tract infection, prostatitis, and after catheterisation. Here's our diagram again, but this one at the time it's applied to prostate cancer biomarker, our PSA. Along the x-axis we have 0 to, to um, 4, either in nanograms per mil or micrograms per litre, is generally regarded as, as the reference interval. And our ideal biomarker for prostate cancer would have all of the normal men, less than four, and those with cancer, greater than four. So if we had this, we would have 100% specificity and 100% sensitivity. But this is the reality. The normal men and those with VPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, go out to about nine, nine or 10, and those with cancer can go down to the two or three level. So there's a fair about amount of crossover. If we're going to use PSA for monitoring, then we need to take some considerations into account. One is reference intervals. There are age-specific reference intervals for PSA. So that as you, you can see that as the age rises from 40, 2.5, it continues to rise into the 70s, the reference interval actually goes up to 6.5. So this has to be taken into account. The other thing that needs to be taken into account is that this is a cancer biomarker, and as with all cancer biomarkers, there can be method-to-method -method differences in values. This is data from our RCPA tumour marker program, and these are the end-of-cycle data showing the regression lines for different methods that are in the program. And you can see, depending on what method you're using, you might get from very low results through to much higher results. So this might be due to different antibodies being used or the different design structure of the assay. So there's an important lesson in that. this. It's that wherever possible, use the same method to monitor a patient over time. The doctor needs to know that the results are coming from the same method so he can determine what's happening in the patient. So how good is PSA? A combination of di digital rectal examination and PSA, that's looking for values greater than four, will detect about 75% of prostatic cancers. Although between 4 to 10 is above the reference interval, only 25% of these people will actually have prostate cancer. So this is the grey zone. And then 15 to 20% of men will have PSA levels within the reference interval, or less than 4. What are some other bi biomarkers that we can use? Percentage of free PSA. So this is the percentage of free PSA over complex PSA. So PSA covalently binds to endogenous serum protease inhibitors like alpha-1 antichymotrypsin. Free PSA is non-active and not complexed. So the risk of cancer increases if the free PSA is less than 25%. 
So this can be useful for eliminating biopsies in those men in that gray area between four and 10. Another test is PSA density. So a man with a lower volume prostate density will be more likely to have cancer of the prostate than a higher volume density. This is a rock curve, a receiver operating characteristics curve of biomarker effectiveness for prostate. So we've plotted here the sensitivity over one over the specificity. The black line is total PSA, the green line is free PSA, and these are some other biomarkers that have been considered. And the higher up into this left-hand corner, the more effective the biomarker. And you can see from this that total PSA and free PSA to slightly lesser degree are actually not very effective biomarkers. However, last month I was in Milan at the Euromed Med Lab meeting and attended a symposium on PSA. And it, the speakers consistently said that PSA is not ideal but it's still the best test that we have for the diagnosis of prostate cancer. They said that there is a requirement for a new biomarker that shows whether there is significant prostate cancer and differentiates benign prostatic hypertrophy. Let's turn now to ovarian cancer. So this is cancerous growth in one or both ovaries. The symptoms for this can be very vague. Bloating, pelvic pain, difficulty eating, and frequent urination. There is actually a high mortality due to lack of success in early diagnosis. And this is a very nasty cancer to have. Metastatic ovarian carcinoma is generally considered to be incurable. So early diagnosis in, when it's in the ovary confined disease is good because there is a 90% survival. CA125 and transvaginal ultrasound are used for diagnosis, but biomarkers for early detection and diagnosis are not available. What's the incidence of ovarian cancer? Well, you can see that the highest incidences are in the northern European countries and then in the United States and at low incidence compared to the rest of the world in Vietnam. What's the five year survival rate? So if the cancer is confined to the ovaries, which is stage one, then there can be up to a 90% survival rate. But once it's moved out of the ovaries, the survival rate is very low at stage four with only about 10% of patients surviving. So CA125, cancer antigen 125, also called carbohydrate antigen 125, also known as mucine 16 because it's encoded by the MUC16 gene. It's not specific for ovarian cancer also found in cancers of the endometrium, the fallopian tubes, the lung, the breast, and the gastrointestinal tract. So it's not specific. So PSA was specific for the prostate. CA125 is not specific. Orco so can be elevated in endometriosis, other diseases of the ovary, menstruation, pregnancy, cirrhosis, and diabetes mellitus. Its sensitivity is poor. It's present in 79% of ovarian cancers and the rest of the patients do not express CA125 at all. About 50% of patients with stage one disease do not have CA125. So another biomarker for early diagnosis is needed. And one of these that has recently come on the market is called HE4. It's a newly introduced biomarker called 
stands for Human Epididymal Protein 4 and is expressed in reproductive and respiratory tissues. It's one of the most commonly upregulated biomarkers in ovarian cancer. It's upregulated both on messenger RMA and at the protein level in both early and late disease. So this can complement CA125. So we're starting to look now at the possibility of using dual markers combining CA125 and HE, HE4 to yield the highest specificity and sensitivity. On our right, we have CA125, and you can see that in the normal population, there's not, there's a, not a clear differentiation between that and those in stage one and two of ovarian cancer. HE4 has better discrimination. This group is clearly discriminated from the normal group. If we combine the two of them, it assists in determining whether a pelvic mass is benign or malignant in pre- and postmenopausal women. Combining these in something that's called ROMA, risk of malignancy algorithm, and this takes the menopausal state into consideration. So you can see in the, in the pre-menopausal, there's a higher weighting of the values than there is in the postmenopausal because CA125 is more often elevated in premenopausal patients with benign diseases. So this correctly classifies 92% of women with epithelial ovarian cancer. Our rock curve shows that, that in premenopausal blue, postmenopausal red, that this is a, a very effective biomarker. So in conclusion, we've seen that cancer biomarkers are used for important clinical decisions, diagnosis, screening, prediction, treatment and monitoring, but that the ideal biomarker does not exist. So most biomarkers are restricted to monitoring cancers once detected by other methods. And we need to continually be aware that there are method-to-method -method differences. So wherever possible, use the same method to monitor a patient. I'd like to acknowledge some help in, a, in this talk. Rhonda Greaves, David Faulkner from the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute in Australia, and Tai Hui Lin from Roche Diagnostics. And I leave you with a picture of a Cape, of a lighthouse at Cape Byron, which is our most easterly point of Australia. <laughs>